ברוך אתה ה' אלוהינו מלך העולם, השם נותן התורה. אמן. אמן. אוקיי. אז אם אתה רוצה לעשות משהו? אתה רוצה לעשות משהו? אתה רוצה לעשות משהו? אתה רוצה לעשות משהו? כן. אוקיי. אז נתחיל עם אזיקיו. אזיקיו, מה זה פליק 2? sort of ended. Um, if there were images of going on, but the beginning of this is again is going to sort of tie up with what was sort of going on. Okay. To give us some sort of indication. Like I said, the images, the imagery that kind of gets used, we could have started this idea of chatting about Leviathan and Behemoth a little, a little, a little while ago when it mentioned the great big dragon or literally the great yes. big dragon. But I thought, okay, let's let's get to the end of this and then we can kind of just draw the pictures and then you can sort of cement in your mind that it means um, scripturally what is it talking about as we're dealing with Pharaoh, right? Mm -hmm. Because what you would have noticed is that when we look at the different imagery or the different descriptions of Leviathan, it's at different times, different contexts. Right, and that's what we can't get into because as if you had any sort of fun looking at anything on Google, there would be a whole mass of interesting information. Some of it helpful, some of it not so much. Some of it is <laughs> And even if you wanted to go into the Rudrash, um more entertaining. Yes. Got, got, got even crazier. Um, so what we can do is I mean, that's going to be more or less the focus on this. And then we'll get into the, the imagery and then bring it kind of full circle. So I'll be happy if we finish chapter 32 tonight with that little comparison. Okay? All right. All right. Let's, let's get into it. Let's get into 32. On the first day of the twelfth month of the twelfth year, the word of Adonai came to me. Human being, raise a lament for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him. So we've spoken about it before. And yeah, he goes into a lament, similar to the king of Tyre, like we said before. This goes into a dirge. Um, he says, you compare yourself to a lion among the nations. In fact, you are more like a crocodile in the lakes. You burst out of your streams, churn the water with your feet, and foul the streams. Okay? Literally, any other translation you should do? Just monster. Okay, yeah, like great monster. monster. Hello, children. Yeah. You guys got enough chairs? Yeah. All right. So, great monster, again, like I said before, it gives you a similar image of, you tell that great dragon is a great monster. All right, so here's what Adonai Elohim says. With many nations assembled, I will spread my net over you, and they will haul you up in a dragnet, and I will throw you on the shore, hurl you into an open field, make all the birds of the air settle on you, and let the animals... Of the whole earth eat their full of you. Okay. So, how big of an animal is this that everything can eat off its coppers? Alright, so it looks a lot bigger than what it is. And this is where we start to see the ideas of something a lot bigger than what is actually going on here. And this actually goes into, shall I say, mythology or folklore. Canaanite folklore. Right? Like I said to you before, when you look up Leviathan, if you wanted to go down that road, you can look up something called Lotan, some spelled slightly differently, he is in a Canaanite deity. Okay? Um, I'm going to read this little portion, then we'll get into Leviathan. I will leave the flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your rotting carcass. I will drench the land in which you swim with your blood as far as the mountains. The waterways will be full of you. I will extinguish you. I will cover the sky and make its stars black. 
I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the sky I will darken above you. I will spread darkness over your land, says Adonai Elohim. Okay. So, we get this idea already that something is so big it's being pulled out. <coughs> okay, interesting imagery. How many of you looked up um, the different types of nets that you use when you go fish? Drag net? That's the ground that goes to the bottom. Right. It's called a dragnet, really, because it drags along the bottom and then they catch this thing in it and then they will be able to pull it up. But obviously this is now something very big. Um, churning the water, fouling the streams, bursting out, says the nations will spread the net over you. So not just one person, not just one thing, but and na the nations will come and drag you out. And then it goes into some very interesting imagery. What imagery did you correlate this to? The moon will not give it light. The sun will be covered with a cloud, the shining lights of the sky will be darkened. It's the egg. It's going to be the rule of first mention first. I thought it was oh. a plague. Right. So it goes Pharaoh, big monster, ripping you out of the Nile. Okay. Ripping you out of your self sustaining sort of idea. And then bring you out. The, the nations will feed off you. And then it starts talking about sort of what we see is end time sort of picture, but very much Pesach, Pesach pictures, right? Okay, so we've got the Nile or the streams. We've got crocodile. And if we understood that correctly, when Moshe threw down his staff, the word in Hebrew is not snake, that's Nachash. It is, uh, I stand to be corrected, Tanin, which means Erepa. Okay, so it could very well be a crocodile that it turned into. We're not 100% sure. Um, the interesting thing about a crocodile is that it was Pharaoh's protector. So if my crocodile ate your crocodiles, your protection is gone. I have destroyed it and I've taken it out. Okay? So, now, if we understand the imagery that this is now talking about something so much bigger and we go into this a little bit we see that there are other different images and so on we get into as previously mentioned you tell that big sea monster as in one reference we tell the great dragon um i think that was in what 30 chapter 30 somewhere there right yes serpent and dragon yeah okay <laughs> We go into now, let's, let's kind of just break this up a little bit. Okay, what scripture references did you guys have when we discuss Leviathan? Okay, there's, um, Is that 27? Job. Okay, right. Job's a big one, we're going to come back to Job, okay? This is Okay, so you guys? Six and seven. Okay, let's, let's just kind of break this up. Before we get to Isaiah, before we get to Isaiah, right? <coughs> Go to me, if you guys check context for Psalm 74. It talks about sea serpents in Psalm 74. Okay, so Psalm 74. Verse 12 to 17. Alright. What sort of context are we dealing with here? Okay, what's what Psalm is about? The relief from oppression. Okay. Um, and then that God is the Almighty King. What is the context of Psalm 74? Mm -hmm. Remember, before you unpack anything, you have to understand the context before which you've taken out. The context of Psalm 74 is a lament for the destruction of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and that God is asked to take out the mythical forces, which is Babylon. Right, so Leviathan actually gets sort of alluded to here as Babylon. Okay? And it is seen as a force of chaos. So the chaos that comes without God. God brings order, God brings planning. You will start to see, your, and, and, and as we get to Job, chaos being a symbol of order. Right? So out of chaos, Leviathan takes it. Right? Yes, no, man. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this sort of 
correspond to anything that you guys have found. All right? So we have this idea that he picks it up here as Babylon. He wants an end to exile. Okay? And they're asking, crying out to God, saying, bring exile finished. Who, how did exile end? Who set them free? Cyrus. Cyrus, who was from what kingdom? Medium Persian. Medium Persian. The Persians conquered Babylonians. The Babylonians, um, remember this was after Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was from Nineveh. But the end of his life, these are for people afterwards. Cyrus comes in, he takes over, and he issues the, the decree. Okay? And that decree ties in with Daniel. We're not going to go there, but anyway. And he brings us in. Now that you sort of understand the song, read that section about Leviathan for me. There you go. Sean, you got this? Yeah. For, for Elohim is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of the Leviathan in pieces and gave them as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up many mighty rivers. The day is yours and the night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth and you have made summer and winter. Okay, so what do you get from that? Many heads. Many heads. Okay. It's a sea creature with many heads. All right. So we get something with many heads. Yeah, it generally kind of gets brought up as seven, right? Seven heads. You guys correlate? Yes? You mm -hmm. find anything like that? In the Midrashic side of things, <coughs> other pictures. It's an interesting reference. I'm going to put it there. Okay, I'm going to put it here, just in hyphens with a little question mark. There's something quite interesting in the book of Revelation. Okay, it actually talks about, um, I think it's Isaiah. Isaiah 11, verse 15. Let's go and see, see what it says there. Isaiah 11, verse 15. It's a sort of like a non-reference, but it gives a veiled reference to once you understand <coughs> the Canaanite mythology. What does it say in Isaiah that verse 15? And Adonai shall put under the ban the tongue of the sea of Mitzrayim, and he shall wave his hand over the river with the might of his spirit, and shall strike it in the seven streams, and shall, cur and shall cause men to tread in... Tread it in sandals. Right, okay, so which river is he striking down? The Nile. The Nile. We're dealing with Pharaoh in chapter 32. Okay, mm -hmm. so it says he's going to strike it down and put it down into seven streams. What else is interesting about Isaiah 11 that mentions seven? Seven spirits. Seven spirits, seven spirits of God. Okay, so here we have sort of an image of seven and seven, a counterfeit, as well as something that needs to be destroyed. Yes? Seven spirits of God, which gives us a picture of our Minovah. Right? I mean, Minovah. The seven branch candelabra, seven branch man. That is to be a picture of the seven spirits of God. Your center one being your shamash or your servant light. Okay? In your text in Isaiah 11, it will be the spirit of Elohim himself. Okay? Which is a nice picture when you say with it's pure gold, something that's pure righteous, okay, that came down from Elohim to serve. You with me? Okay. And then we all of a sudden see a counterfeit. We see a Pharaoh. We see an Egypt, which means bondage. And in that bondage, that's gonna the waters are gonna be struck down and it's gonna be dried up. Here we see Leviathan playing in waters. So on. Okay, so we've got this parallel with God bringing down judgment and justice, and again, it's going to dry up. It's interesting that in Revelation it says there will be no more sea. Right? Sea as in, remember, God parted the waters, he said it was good. Mm -hmm. So is there a problem with the oceans of the world? Mm -hmm. No. That's what they represent in the Hebraic mind. Okay. It means chaos. It was formless and void, and he brought order. He set boundaries. He put things in its place. Right? 
If they overtake it, like in Noah's flood, where God lifted up his boundaries, he did a reverse creation. He let the creation die, and he sent it back basically to what it was. Except there was a man, eight, eight, eight souls on an ark, lifted above the chaos. Okay? He allowed it to succeed, to subside again, and he put everything back into its place. All right? So it's an interesting little veiled reference to something here. Dealing with Pharaoh again, with the seven heads... So I'm just going to put you Isaiah, what was it? Isaiah 27? No, 11 verse. All right. Okay. Go to Psalm 104. Psalm 104, okay, the context of the song is praise for the Creator's perfect world, right? You should see something like that in it. Talks about creation, talks about all things as it should be. It doesn't talk about chaos and brokenness and all the rest of it. Find me the little portion that deals with, that deals with um, Leviathan. Yeah, 25, from about there. Mm -hmm. It speaks of how big it is. There is a sea, great and wide, in which un, which are innumerable swarms, living creatures, small and great. There do ships go, the Leviathan which you made to play there. Okay. There's a, a funny little thing in the way it says it. It's almost as if the... Yeah, you're talking about a perfect world, you're talking about harmony, and yeah, we're talking about ships. Not really creation, sort of... Theology, where did the ships come in? But God says, it's normal, it's okay, they've got ships. And here we've got this Leviathan who seems to be playing amongst the ships. I don't know about you, but that might freak me out. It's a thing is actually the size that it says it is, right? Mm -hmm. This thing is so ginormous that nations can eat off it, right? So we've got this idea that it sort of escorted the ships. But this now, this song completely doesn't talk about some sort of symbol it seems like it's actually talking about an actual animal. Right? In perfect harmony. In perfect harmony. In the song. No chaos. Nothing wrong. Have a Leviathan. Have some ships. God is awesome. He created it all. Slightly different context from 30 songs ago. Okay? So we have some interesting references there. Okay. Um, let's, before we get into Job, um, go to Isaiah 27. If someone would read the backdrop in Isaiah 26, read from those passages to give me context. Before you go into chapter 27, because it happens quite early in 27. You need to go back quite far into 26. Right? Well, yeah, you should be able to pick up at least halfway through 26 which, which period he's talking about or what he's talking about. Can you give me context? Day of the Lord, isn't it? Day of the Lord setting up millennial reign. Mm -hmm. Does anybody agree? Disagree? talks about he would come from the stump of Jesse, he would come and rule, right? Mm. Okay, so we know that out of the stump of Jesse, Messiah came, okay, Jesse being David's father, he came from Judah, and he's coming to reign and set up his kingdom. Okay, so we know the first time he came, he came to establish and talk about the kingdom of heaven. He died to help us get into the kingdom. Nachon? And now, when he comes back, he will set up. Nakon means true in Hebrew. Right. So then when he gets into this position, he goes, all right, now we're going to go in and we're going to establish it. And in 27, find me Leviathan. Verse 1. Right. So what does it say? So it goes from setting up millennial reign, Leviathan. On that day, Adonai, with his great, strong, relentless sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, 
the twisting serpent revived and he will slay the secret spirit. Okay, so here we go. Now all of a sudden, we go back to problematic issues. Okay, so we've got in, sorry, Isaiah what? Uh, 27, 27 verse 1. 27. 27 verse 1. We're talking about end times. Serpent. And he refers to him as a serpent. Any other translation? Great sea, mon sea, sea monster. I think the Hebrew itself says, again, that's that funny word. Crocodile. It means great reptile. Right? Reptile of the sea, great sea monster. And God is going to slay this reptile. The great serpent. And who does that sound like? All right, so now all of a sudden we've got a picture. Now, first we were talking about, we were talking about Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Correlates with Pharaoh over here with the Isaiah 11 thing. Comes up again and he says, no man, it's Babylon. No, it's actually a big animal. And now again, now we're dealing with what looks like the great serpent that needs to be dealt with at the end of time. Revelation 14. Which is again, Revelation 14. Which is going to bring you to something that you knew I was going to what is the meaning of Leviathan? It's, it's, you guys just smelt this on this question was coming. <laughs> you just knew it. So everything points back to what is the meaning mm -hmm. verse? What does the word mean? Ah. <laughs> what this thing is called? It was it, there's a multiple meanings. I actually looked at it yeah. today. Um, but they were even confused. <laughs> yeah, because they're trying to describe something that's um, yeah. either a big whale, crocodile, dinosaur thing that seems to be Babylonian, Egyptian, and demonic, and yet it plays amongst the ships in perfect creation. Yes. Very, very, very strange. So this, this, um, this is the Hebrew King James Strong's. Okay. Go to H3882. It says a wreathed animal, a serpent, figuratively the constellation of the dragon, also a symbol of Babylon. So now it's a star constellation, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen that yet in scripture, right? A large aquatic animal, perhaps an extinct dinosaur. Um, and then it says, yeah, some think this to be a crocodile, but from the description in Job, that's absurd. They don't even know what they're saying. Okay. You look up and you'll see some things that, that mainly most of the guys say it comes back to the word that means coil. Okay, so something that is allowed to twist around and come around you. Oh. Oh, like chaos in circles, like us at time, beats you from all angles. Mm. Like a snake. Mm. Right? It's, it's an interesting image. Some of them will say, oh no, but it wraps it around and it twists itself, so that's what will give us the image of a crocodile, a death roll. Mm. Okay? So once it has you in its jaws, it's going to twist and go and go, and it's going to snap you to pieces and go off. Whatever. But we don't exactly see crocodiles playing with ships. We see, sometimes you might see whales do it, sometimes you might see dolphins do it. But the descriptions, again, we're not exactly sure. Okay? So it's a very interesting sort of idea. Right, now we're going to get into the most descriptive patterns. Do you guys have anything else besides Isaiah 11, 27, Psalms 74, 104? Just Job. Yeah, besides those. Okay? Because Job will mention it probably three times, maybe more. 38, chapter 38, chapter 40 and 41. I think the only guy says that in Revelation, I suppose. That Revelation will make a correlation. Say it, but Job. Okay, so that's the reference we're going to. Alright, so hit me up with Job. What do we see with Job? Very descriptive. While you're looking at that, let me read you an inter interesting reference. From a Canaanite source called the Rashamra, um, 67 verse 1 and 1, describes Lotan, okay, which is Leviathan, virtually in the same identical words as what it has in Isaiah 27. When thou hast smitten Lotan, the fleeing serpent, and had put an end to the put an end to the torturous serpent, 
the mighty one with seven heads. It doesn't exactly say seven heads in Isaiah 27, right? But it's very similar to the way it's being destroyed. The difference is, instead of Elohim, in the Canaanite issue, we have Baal doing something against the life. All right, and that should already prick up your ears because again we have a counterfeit idea. What does Baal mean? Lord, as in landlord normally, or husband. Okay, so again we've got this counterfeit idea of Yeshua coming to establish himself, establish millennial reign, establish his kingdom for his bride. And here we see some sort of fake counterfeit again taking place and warping people's perceptions of life. Okay. Um, right, Job, which, what are we talking about in Job, which chapter? Well, in Job uh, 3, okay. I see his first mention, where he's, he curses his birth, and he speaks of how horrible that day is supposed to be, the darkness, it must be deleted from the year's calendar, deleted from all months, and then it says, let that night be silent. Let no singing come to it. Let those who curse it, who curse the day, who are ready to stir up Leviathan. Right. So it comes sort of into, into the thinking, again, the mythological thinking, that Leviathan could have swallowed up the time of his birth and then it wouldn't have caused any issues. Interesting. So if he was never born, yeah. where and how we get to the idea yeah, that... Sense. Leviathan is able to do that. Verse seven, verse if it was us at time, he's saying he should have destroyed me before I was even created. No, no. Okay? So it is an interesting reference. Where else have we got? Uh, depends on the Bible. But most Bibles, I think, would start at chapter 41, verse 1. In mine, it's Job 40, verse 25. Yeah, we have 40. 40, verse, verse 25. 25 to 41, pretty much to the end of 41. Okay. So the end of 41. Yeah. Which is 20, 26, verse 26 or 34, depending on the Bible. What have we got? So I read it. Yeah. And Leviathan, can you catch him with a fish hook or hold his tongue down with a rope? Can you put a ring in his nose or pierce his jaw with a barb? Will he entreat you at length? Will he speak with you softly? Will he agree with you to be your slave forever? Will you play with him as you would with a bird? Or keep him on a string to amuse your little girls? Will a group of fishermen turn him into a banquet? Will they divide him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with darts? Or his head with fish spears? If you lay your hand on him, you won't forget the fight, and you'll never do it again. Look, any hope of capturing him is futile. One would fall prostrate at the very sight of him. No one is fierce enough to rouse him. So who can stand up to me? Who has, give, who has given me anything and made me pay it back? Everything belongs to me under all of heaven. All right. Stop there. <coughs> so what context is he giving you? Why would, why, would, why would God talk to Job about Leviathan? Saying that he's greater than you. He's even greater than the wife, yes. right? He created the wife. And you, little piece of dust, yeah. cannot even catch him. Are you going to negotiate with him? Are you going to stab him with a spear? Are you going to pull him up? Is he going to whisper sweet nothings into you saying, please let me go, let's come to some arrangement? No, in fact, you can't even deal with whatever this animal is. It's used in the context of an animal. Okay, so again, we, we've got this idea of Psalm 104. And he says, you, you can't deal with this. It's like something fearful. Something so much stronger, something so much greater, something you can't, you can't catch it, you fishermen can't drag this thing out. It's just too big. Now, if it was, uh, it could lead us into the inkling of maybe a massive Nile crocodile. Yeah, but the next portion confuses yeah. that. But again, starts off with an animal, just like when we talk about the king of fire, starts off with the king of fire, and then goes off onto something so much more, right? Which is why I wanted to draw this out for you, so that you can see God using something maybe physical to give us a spiritual picture of something a little bit more. So he starts off with the context, basis goes from an animal, something massive, something strong, something that they can't handle, and then goes on to, carry on. I have more to say about his limbs, his strong talk, and his matchless strength. 
who can strip off his scaly garment, who can enter his jaws, who can pry open the doors of his face, so close to his terrible teeth. His pride is his rows of scales, tightly sealed together. One is so close to the next that no air can come between them. They are stuck one to another, interlocked and impervious. Still sounds like a crocodile in mm -hmm. this part. Yeah. This James is evident. <laughs> when he sneezes, light flashes out. His eyes are like the shimmer of dawn. From his mouth go fiery torches and sparks come flying out. His nostrils belch steam like a cauldron boiling on the fire. His breath sets coals ablaze. Flames pour from his mouth. Strength resides in his neck and dismay dances around of him, ahead of him, as he goes. The layers of his flesh stick together. They are firm on him, immovable. His heart is as hard as a stone. Yes, hard as a lower millstone. When he rears himself up, the gods are afraid. Besides themselves in despair. If a sword touches him, it won't stick. Neither will a spear or a dart or a lance. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. An arrow can't make him flee. For him, sling stones are so much chaff. Aren't, are so much chaff. Clubs counters hay, and he laughs at a quivering javelin. His belly is as sharp as fragments of pottery, so he moves across the mud like a threshing sledge. He makes the depths seethe like a pot. He makes the sea boil like a perfume kettle. He leaves a shining wake behind him, making the deep seem to have white hair. On earth there is nothing like him, a creature without fear. He looks straight at all high things. He is king over all proud beasts. Right. Okay, so obviously in your commentaries you'll see some sort of fire-breathing dragon idea. Um, <coughs> now we do should know where they get that from. You can understand where they get the crocodile imagery. You don't really hear of many animals laughing and sort of standing up or having pride that comes up over it. So you could start with making an allusion to his going to something else here. Okay? Could it be that something of all creation, that he mocks all creation, nothing is greater than what he was. And remember, mm -hmm. he, were angels created? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? So, something higher than all creation. No one can hook it, no one can stop it, no one can do anything. Okay? So it's just one of those images that go off on a little note that we don't exactly see where, where in its fullness it goes to, but it goes from an animal to something, maybe again, something a little bit more mythical. Mythical and maybe a little bit something closer to a satan again, maybe. Kind of leaves it hanging up in the air, yes? yes. All right. Do we have any other references? Do they hide themselves on the top of Carmel? There I will hunt them down and seize them. Do they hide from me at the bottom of the sea? There I will command a serpent to bite them. And then it's like a reference to chapter 2, verse 14 to 15. It's in the word about Pharaoh and the snakes. Okay. Let's just be figurative. Okay. Right. More or less. Without scratching too much into this, you basically have a general idea of what's going on here, okay? Um, shall we ask the question? Extra biblical sources. Because I've got one fancy guy from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't go into that. Okay. You guys look up if any Midrashic ideas, anything that Jews might have said. Maybe that sort of kind of helped you. Okay. I'm almost proud. <laughs> right? Because most of the stuff that you read about is, um, let's just say, rather interesting. Let me, let, me, let me give you one. And then you can kind of see what, I'm, what, you, what you're dealing with. Um, Leviathan was created on the fifth day. Male and female forms, this is according to the Midrash, of the monster were created, but God slew the female, lest the species should multiply and destroy the world. 
The flesh was reserved for the banquet that is to be given to the righteous at the advance of the Messiah. Okay, so we have a, some little reference about feeding people in the wilderness, right? Okay, so we can sort of gauge where that's going wrong, and maybe if we mix our timelines up a little bit, you see at the end of it, he's going to slay it then, and then all the righteous are going to be in the wilderness, maybe? Okay, I'm not trying to give this credence, but I'm trying to just mm -hmm. help you follow logic. The puritanical variation appears in the comments of Rabbi Judah Bar Simon, who declared that those who had not taken part in pagan sports should be allowed to participate in the burning of Leviathan and the behemoth. The behemoth is, um, I think, the male version and the Leviathan is the female version. Another version states that Gabriel will be in charge of killing the monster, which I find interesting because Gabriel is only ever mentioned as a messenger, right? Not if they said Michael, maybe a better bet. And he will be unable to accomplish the task without the help of God. That we can say for sure. A particularly imaginative version of the story concerns Jonah and the whale. At creation, God made a fish intended to harbor Jonah. The prophet was, a com was comfortable inside of the fish as if it were a spacious synagogue. Right? Because that's the description we have of Jonah sitting in a spacious synagogue. The eyes of the fish served as windows. Light was provided by a diamond which illuminated not only the inside of the well, but also the sea on the outside down to the very bottom. So he had a disco light. The sea creatures were so created. When their allotted time had come, they went to Leviathan. Who would devour them? While Jonah was in the well's belly, he was told that it was about to happen. A whale with Jonah inside approached Leviathan, whereupon Jonah said, For thy sake I come here. I came hither. It was, sorry, it was meet that I should know thine abode, for it was my appointed task to capture thee in the life to come and slaughter thee on the table just for the righteous. So Jonah says, I sh in the life to come, I'm going to destroy you. Leviathan <coughs> fled in terror so that Jonah and the whale were saved. The whale therefore, thereupon took Jonah and on a guided tour of places that would interest the prophet. The river from which the oceans flow, the place where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, Gehenna, Sheol, and many other wonderful places. And so we go on. Okay. The story of Jonah you never ever heard about. Yes. All right. My point. Compare. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We get idea that we talk about Leviathan spirits. We talk about this. We talk about that. And when I, what I say to everybody, we tie it up with scripture. If it doesn't say that in scripture, where did you get your source? Okay? I don't, I don't want to sound mean. I don't care who told you that that's the fact. And I don't care what you experienced. If it's not in scripture, I don't want to know about it. Okay? Why do I say that? Because the Egyptian wise man who replicated three of God's wonders. Three, not one, three. Never reversed them, replicated them. They thought they were right because their experience was we have power. Be very careful. Scripture, Torah, talks about even if a prophet does miracles and wonders and he tells you to worship another God, don't believe him. Even if he does miracles, mm. even if you have a supernatural experience, as the fan is very powerful, don't let him catch you unawares. Okay? We need, obviously, which is my point of call for all of these things, to go and sort of touch base with what Scripture talks about, and now we can sort of come and tie in. Revelations. What did you see in Revelations concerning this? Revelations 13. Okay, the Great East.
And I saw a beast come out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. Oh, mm. Stop there. Right? Now we know that has context to do with Daniel. Yeah. Right? And ten heads, seven horns. Ten horns. Ten horns right, seven. Yeah. Ten horns, seven heads, and remember there is three horns that get displaced. <coughs> okay? And the eighth one comes up and we know that's the Antichrist, right? Okay? The seven heads are seven hills. It's described. It tells you exactly. Seven hills, seven, seven capitals. Right? Which it makes it interesting because when you start to study a little bit of geography, you realize that it has to be Rome, founded on seven hills. The problem is, so is Jerusalem. Dun, dun, dun. There's lots of hills and valleys. So which one is it? We don't know for sure yet. Keep your eyes open and all line up in Scripture. When the time comes, all the dots will be connected. Right? At this point, we can speculate. We can look at the time frame and we look at function and character to be able to define or show us at least what this Antichrist is going to look like and where they're going to come from. All right? The fact that it comes out the sea will tell you that either it is an organization that deals in chaos, and we're not talking about our unorganized ideas, we're talking about Babylonian chaos. What does Babylon get reference for? Again, Babylon the Great Hall. It's a spiritual or a false religion, a spiritual identity, as well as a city that gets established, right? Out of the sea could reference a few things. Gentile nations, mm -hmm. and again, out of darkness. Could be both. Okay? So as we look at these little interesting things and how they tie up, and what makes it interesting is when we carry on with this idea, we're going to see some very interesting imageries, just as we started to see with Pesach popping up, and we know they correlate. Okay, to give you an example, um, the stars, the sun, and the moon. Okay, um, you can look at Revelations eight, Revelations eight verse eight. While you're in Revelations, if you read from around verse eight to verse thirteen. What do we see? Mountain hills into the sea. Okay. Third of the sea turned to blood. Okay, so we're dealing with water again. Third of the living creatures in the sea died. Yes. And third of the ships were destroyed. Okay. What else do you see? Okay, we're reading. Third angel sounded his shofar, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky onto a third of the rivers and onto the springs of water. The names of the star, the name of the star was bitterness, and Third of the water became bitter, and many people died from water that had been turned bitter. Mm -hmm. The fourth angel sounded his shofar, and a third of the sun was struck, also a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. The day had a third less night, and the night likewise. <clears throat> then I looked, and I heard a lone eagle give a loud cry as it flew in mid heaven. Woe, woe, woe to the people living on earth because of the remaining blasts from the three angels who had yet to sound their shofars. And let me remind you here again what we just read. I will, I will extinguish you. I will cover the sky and make its stars black. I will cover the sun with a cloud. And the moon will not give its light. And the shining, all the shining lights in the sky will darken above you. I will spread darkness over the land, says Adelaide. Okay? So as much as we see correlation with Passover, remember, you don't understand Revelations until you understand Pesach. What was the point of Pesach? Not the, not the points of the individual place. What was the point? To redeem people. Before we get to redemption, God's dealing with two different groups of people. Okay. God's yeah. people and everybody else. Yes. To what show was them who he was. Right. Okay. Challenge every one of their gods and show them that he was God. Mm. Okay. Main point. Right. What is the difference between revelations, judgments? And the people? Mm -hmm. Shall I complicate matters? Shall I complicate Right, you guys will see, I'm just going to do this quickly. When you're dealing with people groups uh, around Passover, you really just kind of have two different groups of people. You have what they call the Hebrews, and then you have the Egyptians. 
right? Mm. I hear that when you deal with things like that, you've got pictures of Pharaoh, yeah, as well, so as Egypt comes back, right? But Leviathan. So we have Hebrews and Egyptians. What separated the two of them from logic and spirituality? Only one God's name. Not really. One was a slave. That was spirituality. Spirituality. Hmm. Previously to Moses or at the time of Moses? Oh. Uh, if you're talking about the, the, the blood and the doorpost, you're no, talking about. No, no, before the plague started. They cried out. Okay, but they didn't know. They didn't know God. Yeah. So, what was the difference between them and the Egyptians? Yeah. No. So as God was teaching the Hebrews who he was, he was teaching the Egyptians who he was. Mm -hmm. But he was using Egyptian symbols. Why didn't he use Hebrew symbols? Because well, they didn't even know his name anymore. Right? They didn't, they didn't know who he was. They didn't know what he was about to do. What were they crying out for? Freedom? Or for the slavery to be a little bit less um, painful? Freedom. Oh says the slavery, the bondage had become difficult. They didn't say, Abba, get us out of here. This is ridiculous. We're sons of Abraham. When are we going to move? The 400 years is up. You don't hear any of that. Yeah, they didn't have God like that. Fast forward to the Babylonian captivity. You've got Daniel reading Jeremiah and he says, Abba, you said 70 years. It's, it's 70 years. My suitcase is packed. What the heck is going on? Why aren't these people packing? Didn't they learn from last time? God remembered an identity, but he still wanted to deal with his creation. Mm. Right. Okay, so let's fast forward. We have God's people again. I'm just going to use Hebrews. Mm. What does the word Hebrew mean? Crossed over. We've crossed over. From, from the world to God, basically. And then you have the world. Mm. You can use the term Egyptians because Egyptian means bondage. So everybody was stuck in the world system. Everybody was stuck in Babylon. Mm. When he comes again, what's the difference between them and us spiritually? We know now who he is. You're expecting him coming. You're expecting redemption. You're expecting an exodus in whatever shape or form. Rapture? Take it off. If you don't believe in rapture, let's argue the case that we all go sit somewhere and we hide in Petra and no one knows because they can't find a copy of, a copy of the Bible anyway. And we're all hiding away and we're separate because we know the time is coming. Okay? But we actually have the bride, the groom, and the guests within the Hebrews. The groom is the easiest one to identify. Who's the groom? Yeshua. Right. So, we've got Yeshua. The bride, let's talk about functionality, not identification. Does the bride know the groom is coming? Mm -hmm. At some point, yes. Yeah. Do we know the time or the hour exactly? No, but we know the season. Mm -hmm. Right? So we know that he's coming any time from, and if we put this back in biblical practice, he goes away, he prepares a place between six months and 12 months. Within that time frame, he's going to come back and fetch me. I need to be ready at any given time, because when he comes, there will be a loud shofar. Yes. Interesting that these pictures that we're talking about here deal with the shofar judgment. It's interesting. Shofar can be a call to assembly, or war. a call to war, or a call to worship. Right? Marching orders. It's an interesting picture. Okay? But don't get confused between that and one Thessalonians. Right? It's not the same show for I don't know that because in chapter 5 it talks about peace. If there is peace and it's a worldwide tribulation, would I call that peace? Probably not. Okay? So somehow one deals with peace and one is in the midst of complete tribulation into the second set of seven judgments. The difference between this Pesach and this Pesach this exodus and that exodus is this one is expected. 
this group I'll kind of yeah I'm just gonna carry on doing what I feel like until he comes and then I'm gonna quickly say my amends and say sort yeah then you get the invite yeah <laughs> and then we're like oh, oh snap <laughs> could have been everybody floating away let me open up this invitation go right my oil. <laughs> let's go buy oil you're not prepared you're not expecting and they weren't expecting now for me, use it on use it, the pre-tribulation rapture of the people expecting the Italians to go through. The reason the Hebrews had to go through all the plagues is because that Marui was a Marui's name. Okay? Slightly different context to the similar issue. Been betrothed, you've been sealed. Sealed talks about the Ruach HaKodesh, New Covenant, it is a seal of protection. Now, give me a quick clap. I know this is, I'm only doing this because it's Revelations, but it's kind of there. I think I read it in. Uh, yeah, it talks about. Oh, wait, no, no, no. It's, no, it is there. The seal is talking about a seal of perfection, but I just want to go back to Isaiah 26 quickly. And look at verse 20. Tell me what verse 20 says. Come, my people, into your rooms and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the rest has passed. Is passed. So let me ask the question. If mountains are falling, rivers are turning into blood, people are dying left, right, and center, locusts, plagues, all the rest of it, let's put it fullness in context of what Revelation talks about. Where are you going to hide? It says that people will hide in mountains and they will say, let it fall down, shut on us, let God not see us. They're going to try to hide underground and they're still not going to get it right. It's an interesting little illustration, isn't it? See, for Adonai emerges from his palace, from his place to punish those on earth for their sin. Then the earth will reveal the blood shed on it and no longer conceal its land. So if he's going to take on the earth and you're hiding, you need to be somewhere else. Use it, don't use it. It's my logic. Sharing what I see in connection with what we're dealing with here. Okay? Right. So Leviathan seems to be something that's going to be dealt with at end times. Okay? It seems to me a picture of an animal. We don't exactly know what animal, whether it's fire breathing or not. Kind of looks like a sea animal because the ocean is only big enough to take it. Some people believe dinosaurs. Some people believe, I think, a crocodile doesn't really fit the ball. But because of the scales and the fact that it's really hard, the underside of the, of the crocodile is pretty soft. Right, it says it threshes. It's so hard. Because it all doesn't have steam coming out. <laughs> <laughs> also, general, <laughs> really, it's probably not a crocodile. The crocodile is on fire <laughs> <laughs> internally. Should have stayed away from the Nando's. <laughs> and here we have interesting illustration. All right, less Confucius. Uh, you know, what a heck. Yeah, no, I'm not. No, I'm not going to go. I was going to talk about the two witnesses, I'm not going to go there. Unless you want me to talk about the two witnesses. All right. Behemoth. A little bit less of a Confucius conundrum when it comes to all 47 million scripture verses. What sort of pictures do you have? Brontosaurus. <laughs> Quite possible. <laughs> Some sort of ginormous it animal. It's grass. <coughs> it eats grass. I like to watch that to get that. <laughs> Which <laughs> is interesting when you look at the name Behemoth. Some people can believe it comes from, and I hope I pronounce this right, Behemah, which is Egyptian for water ox. So when it says it eats grass like an ox, maybe the name actually means water ox, and that's how we get to rhinoceros. <laughs> 
<laughs> or a hip opportunist. Right. So what do you have? What scripture references? Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hide that piece of paper here. Yeah. Are you guys all happy with this? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna steal a piece of paper here for Okay. Lightly defined as something big. Any sort of identification marker becomes more a description. Something that is a behemoth is something larger. Like I said, the closest definition we can get is an Egyptian word that references four dogs. Jolly, that's fantastic information. Some big thing that eats grass. So one we have a sea creature, and on the other side we have something that seems to be a land creature. Okay? So we've got slightly different images. What scripture reference do you have for behemoth? Uh, 14. 15, 24. So 14. <coughs> 15 to 24. Okay. What do we have? Describe this animal form of the state. Tail like a cedar. So tail like a cedar. Thistle like. Okay. And it's got brush on the end of it, some people will say. Like Strength in his loins, his power is in his stomach muscles. Um, the sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His ribs are like bars of iron. He is the beginning of the ways of El. His maker brings near his sword. Okay. So again, something that was created. Something that is apparently ginormous. Mm. Okay? So if we were to try and unpack this, okay, let's just try and look at the images. Okay? So we've got bronze, legs. Bronze, bones, yeah. Yeah? His mm -hmm. limbs are like iron bars and his bones are so, like bronze pipes. Okay. <coughs> I've got bronze. I've got silver somewhere. Silver or iron? Uh, iron, yeah. Iron bars. His so ribs. Limbs. Ribs. Well, his ribs yeah. are iron. Okay. Silver. Tail cedar. Okay, we've got muscles are like cables. Okay, we've got some cedar. And then we've got some. Yeah, I'm trying to bring it to you. Gable muscle. Uh, it's a tank. <laughs> <laughs> and it eats gross. <laughs> just, just because we need, we need it to. It does. Right. It's a farm machine. Okay, so we've got a tail. All right, let's look at this. Okay, so bronze legs. If we were to make a spiritual illustration, what would you gain? What would you gain from that? Bronze brass representation of what? Uh, um, judgment. Judgment. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you've got something in his legs that are like judgment, okay, stands on you, you squish. Iron? Very, very hard. Very hard. Okay, normally you switch out to war. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could sort of make an illustration of war. Mm -hmm. See that? Nice Tully. smelling. Tully. Used for building. Why? It was long. It was long enough. You can only build as long as your roof is, right? So you can. You have to pack cedars on, they use them for the bigger portions to be able to support your roof structure. Mm. Right? It also had a lovely smell. Mm. Okay? So something, I remember, cedar was something that you would be envious of. So it was so big that it became envious. Right? Cables. Something yeah. like this, something strong. Thumb suck. And eats grass. Nebuchadnezzar. Because <laughs> 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 he was as tall as a cedar, actually. Yeah. It was mentioned as a cedar. <clears throat> right, eats grass. <clears throat> Perfect in creation. Mm. Remember, meat eaters only came later. Mm. Only after the fall. So the fact that the lion again will eat grass when everything's done should tell you something about this. Mm -hmm. 
if we were going to try and make something of it spiritually and trying to see if we were missing something in the layers. Something that will bring judgment for war, you'll be envious of its strength because of perfect creation. Can we align this to any sort of animal or any sort of being? It's kind of difficult. Okay? If that's a tiny it's Leviathan, maybe this is Michael. You know. Right? We could say he was also a created being. He's also mighty on all the earth. Doesn't come out of chaos. Stays in balance with God. He's the one that brings out judgment. He was the one who called for backup in God. Leviathan tossed out, or Hasatan tossed out of heaven, if we were going to make that illustration. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that is it. I'm saying that if we unpack the layers, maybe there's something here, and if you want it, use it. Don't use it. Okay? This is what tonight's about. It's literally about unpacking it, looking at it, not solving it. Okay? Maybe I was going to turn around and go, you know what I mean? Seriously. It's an ox. Well, why are you guys going to go in there? How is an ox, Michael? Does he eat grass? <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> so he could go and you completely lost your marbles. But we have to look at the imagery and understand that Hebrew is about function. Okay? When we look at this again, we look at something that is land, something that is massive, something that is strong, and again, the Midrash in this goes a little bit crazy. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll mention to you <coughs> off camera, and ladies, you can close your ears. There are different images that go on here. Okay. It's interesting that uh, Revelation obviously talks about the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. Yes. And that's why there's sea and earth. I mean, yeah, sea and earth. Sea and earth, which is a good point, because what some people go into, and again, we don't really see anything else beside this, okay, with behemoth. Some people will call this and I just read the commentary of the unholy trinity. Or the unholy triune. Okay. Right? Because you have the false prophet, the beast. Asatan, the beast, and Antichrist. Okay? So the prophet who goes up before Antichrist, all being empowered by the beast who comes out of the sea, which is Asatan, right? Okay, so we see an unholy triune versus the Holy Trine. Yes? Okay? And we can kind of see a battle being taking place here. The Ruach parts the waters, brings order, where Leviathan is all about chaos. Yes? Mm -hmm. The Word was on land, then break a twig. Makes sense. I think scripture references talks about he's so homeless that he barely broke a, a leaf or something along those lines. Paraphrasing it. Okay? And then we have the one who's empowering the one side versus Hasatan who's empowering the other side. Okay? So we could take it to that level. Is it 100 percent correct? It's a bit of a stretch. We don't know. It's kind of great. Okay, and that's okay, because, you know what, we're not meant to understand everything here. If we did, we wouldn't need God, we wouldn't need the world. And some of these things, I think, will only truly be revealed when we consider these things and go, about what were you talking about? And he goes, oh, it's not yes. <laughs> right? But like I said, with the Leviathan, you're dealing with different imagery that seem to tie up with the beast. Right? So in Revelations, it does sort of correlate not only to an animal that is massive and great and that was something that was created by God. And again, it's funny that you see him escorting the ships in a way. And then in Revelations, you see once Babylon falls, the ships and the captains of the ships and the merchants crying out saying, who's going to buy our stuff? They're the ones that are mourning. Interesting. Right? So we have, again, with all of this, different layers that you've got to look at. Okay? I find it very interesting that when you look at the scriptures that are referencing this stuff, it talks about end times. It talks about God restoring. It talks about coming up against chaos. It talks about the day of the Lord. Yes? It's, it's very interesting as well, as because, you know, when, with those ships and no one buying anything, um, it's like the, the trade is all messed up now and that's exactly what happened when 
the good news spread to Rome. The, the people that would sell the meat for the sacrifices to their gods went out of business because Christianity as it was then, the new believers stopped doing that and started doing what they needed to do. But this also it just sort of speaks about sin. You know, for me it's that it's sin that causes chaos, brings about chaos. And um, you know, that animal reference. There's been there's been teachings um, with Alyssa Ol Olwan, what is it? I think that's her name. Mm -hmm. Where she talks about, you know, your inner your inner self being that that in the, what 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 is the word in the fish? Yeah, it's self. That yeah, that, that sort of animal instinct, that that intrinsic evil that sort of sits within, you know, which brings about chaos. And I know the the the, the sages likened Hasatan in some instances to that evil eye, that evil inclination that that sort of lives within you. And this sort of brings about a picture that you know when when God when when Yeshua eventually comes back at that time, and that sort of sin is just taken away and that new creation coming in it's almost as if for me Leviathan is that that animal that coils around you the sin that, that sort of lives around you mm -hmm. which which is very difficult to live with but yeah yeah it's very interesting that most of <clears throat> most of our if you look at the world's surface area mm. everything is surrounded by water mm. everything is surrounded by chaos Everything is held in check because God has said so, right? But then, obviously, end times, we're going to see all of that stuff just go into complete break down, shut down, until eventually everything is completely destroyed and then he has to make everything new as he promised he would restore all these things, right? So again, tonight's exercise was about you to look at the scripture reference, look at what was going on. If you were going to go into the Midrash, test the Midrash to see if there was anything that was beneficial that was coming out of it. Could we follow some sort of logic? If not, I mean, there were some extra chemical books that you talk about the Book of Enoch and those sort of things, but yeah, right. we don't really take into that purely because there are many funny things that are, that are in there. It's not a trustworthy source. Okay, so it might have some interesting things that people cling on to. Um, You've got to take it as a whole, right? If it's the same writers that wrote it the whole way through and they give you 90% truth and 10% funny, I said that under that in the God of Eden, I'm not going to stick to that, right? So I'd rather leave those extra chemical books to the one side. All right, anything else you guys wanted to add to Behemoth, Leviathan, <coughs> the Unholy Triune? No? I thought we were just talking about animals. All right. Let's get back into chapter 32. <coughs> All right. I think I stopped at verse 9, yes? Yeah. yeah. Ezekiel 32, verse 9. I will anger many peoples when I bring your destroyed ones in among the nations. Into countries you have not known. I will make many peoples aghast in you. The kings will shudder in horror over you. When I brandish my sword before them on the day of your downfall, they will tremble cautious, uh, continuously. Each man in fear of his own life. Remember, he's dealing with Pharaoh here. And he's saying, when Pharaoh falls, everybody else is going to be very nervous. For Adonai Elohim says this, and... You know, Rena brought up a very good point, something we need, I need to mention that uh, I kind of just glanced over. When you see Adonai, big capital letters in the Bible, or Lord, big L, or, and then the rest in lowercase, that's the word for Adonai, and Elohim in all caps is Yudhei Vavre, right? So he brings in, the sword of the king of Babel will come up against you. So now he's dealing again with Egypt. It's funny that he uses one nation. And both of these images we see tying up with Leviathan. With the swords of the warriors, I will cause your hordes to fall. They are all the most barbarous of the nations, and they will shatter the glory of Egypt. All its hordes will be destroyed. Mm. Interesting side note. 
how the term biases, and now that's Persia, come in and really, really, really destroy Egypt. I know he's dealing with Babylon, yeah, this is, this is a rabbi. What did Egypt, was Egypt a good warring nation? Yes, very good, okay. <coughs> what did they revere or what did they high and higher esteem in their war status or the fact that they could champion their chariots and so on? They got. They got. Okay. So, how do I get them from stop charging? I throw gods at them. So, okay, Bias has got a whole bunch of cats. And he threw them at them, and Egypt would not charge. Hmm. So, they started to take territory back using their own logic against them. That they could not go in if they accidentally hit a cat and killed one of their deities, big problem. So he used the deities against them and then actually conquered it. Interesting story, go check it out. I will destroy all her cattle besides her plentiful waters. No human foot will trouble them again, nor the hoof of any animal. Then I will make their water clear and cause their stream to flow like oil, says Adonai Elohim. When I make the land of Egypt a ruined waste, a land of all that filled it, when I strike all loose who live there, they will know that I am Adonai. This is the lament that they will raise. Their daughters of the nations, again, nations, see, will use it to mourn. They will chant it for Egypt and all its hordes, says Adonai. Elohim. On the 15th day of the month of the 12th year, the word of Adonai came to me, human being, wail for the hordes of Egypt. Send them with the daughters of the mighty nations down to the underworld. Again, just stop there for a second. What is God asking Ezekiel to do? Lament. Cry. Why? But it's Egypt. It's the nations. Moses. The difference between Jonah and what God is commanding Ezekiel to do. I knew you were going to save him. That's why I didn't want to come. That's what he said against Nineveh. He said, you were just going to forgive them anyway. So why did you forgive them? I hate those guys. Ezekiel? Priest. The point is to bring the nations in. The point is to show the world the light of God. And we'll cry out to them. This is not just your people, this is my creation. So he was a priest, eh? Is he killed? Yeah. Right. So you're sitting here looking at what does it mean to be a kingdom of priests? It doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what your liturgy is, it doesn't matter what, what your genealogy is, it doesn't matter anything. Ultimately, God created the entire world and he wants the world to be saved. Yeshua cried out so that not one would be lost that you've given him. Right? Don't just pray for the ones that are in Belish. Pray for those that are outside. Even more so. Right? We get stuck into the same family. Come, lock you up, let's pray. Let's pray that fellowship is okay. That's fellowship. And that's important. We need to make sure that we, are, that we ask Abba to take care of us and that his will is done and that his work pours in so that we can change, so we can get better, so we can lead more people in. So that he can change the heart, so that we can love one another. Because this is the way that they would identify us. Not that you know Torah and you flash your tzitzit and you keep Shabbat, that you would love one another. This they will know. If you've got no love, it doesn't matter what you do. This is a hard lesson. We only pray for people that we like. Yeshua says, pray for those who persecute you. Even those that are shouting at you. Even those that are growling at you. Even tell you that they're stupid and you don't believe in God. Do you know the truth? When Yeshua comes, there's no if, maybe. We just don't know the time. When he comes, every knee will bow. And there will be no second job. So, be the person who stands in the gap. 
that might be your prayer that gets God in gear to be able to save that person. Okay? Are you more beautiful than others? Go down and lie with the uncircumcised dead. They will fall among those killed by the sword. She is given to the sword. Pull her down with her forwards. From the depths of Shaul, the mighty warriors, the mightiest warriors will speak of him. With those who helped him, they went down, they lie still, the uncircumcised killed by the sword. Remember, it was a, somehow dying by an uncircumcised hand was worse than dying by a circumcised person, which is a very strange thing, but it was their logic in the time. Asher, there with her hordes, their graves all around them, all of them slain, killed by the sword. Interesting. Why do we go to Assyria? Who conquered Assyria? Egypt. Wasn't it Egypt? It was actually Babylon. It was a two front wall, but Babylon came up as the next superpower. Mm. Yeah. Remember, but God kind of had a hand in that taking up virtually the entire army. Yeah. yeah. Right? So when Babylon was still in its infancy trying to come up, they were dealing and trying to fight off and not winning. Assyria was slapping them left, right, and center. Go and do some history studies. It's a very interesting time. From Egypt as a superpower, Assyria came next. From Assyria as a superpower came Babylon. From Babylon as a superpower came Persia. Right? You're basically looking at, in biblical times, to the point of Rome, seven, maybe, well, yeah, about seven sections. Right? Let me, let me just make sure I'm right. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and something Rome like. When we look at that statue, we have seven sections, really, of the kingdoms of man that have come into something Rome like. And now we can look at America and say, look, it's brought from the Senate, or, it's Senate or, or, or Europe. If it's united, it would be very Rome like. There's not going to be another Egypt, there's not going to be another Greece as it was. It's not going to be another conquering empire. Something else has to come up. Okay? Assyria is there with its hordes, their graves around them. They said, they took on God. Who is your God? He sent us to destroy you. And then they met one angel and then 185,000 people died. Their graves are in the deepest part of the pit. Her hordes all around her, her grave, all of them slain, killed by the sword. Those who terrorized the land of the living Elim is there, and her hordes, and her grave of the slain, killed by the sword, descended uncircumcised into the underworld. Those who terrorized the land of the living, they bear their shame together, and those who descended into to the pit. They've given her a bed among the slain of the hordes, her graves are there around her. All of them uncircumcised, killed by the sword, because they terrorized the land of the living, and they bear the shame of those who descended into the pit. They are put, sorry, they are put among those who were slain. Meshech and Tubal, with her horde is there, her graves all around them. All of the uncircumcised, killed by the sword, they terrorized the land of the living. Are you seeing a pattern yet? You were lifted up, you were given power, what did you do? You made it about your kingdom. Where's your kingdom now? In Sheol. They do not lie with the fallen warriors of the uncircumcised who descended into Sheol. With their weapons of war, their swords laid under their heads and the crimes upon their bones, because these warriors terrorized the land of the living. But they will be broken among the uncircumcised with those who are killed by the sword. There is Edom. Oh, this is getting closer to home, Israel. Her kings and all her princes, who despite all their power, are laid with those who are killed by the sword, with the uncircumcised, with those who descended into a pit. There are all the princes of the north, all of them, and the Sidoni, who descended to the slain, ashamed of all the terror they caused by the power they lay, uncircumcised with those killed by the sword, bearing the shame with those who descended into the pit. So remember when we talk about uncircumcision, you're normally talking about someone that's out of covenant who doesn't know God here, right? Because just remember the Phoenicians and they practice circumcision. All of these Pharaoh will see and he will be consoled about his hordes. Pharaoh and all his army, slain by the sword, says Adonai Elohim. For I put my terror in the land of the living, and he will lie among the uncircumcised, with those killed by the sword, 
Pharaoh and all his force, says Adonai Elohim. You were lifted up, you were given opportunity, all you did was try and explain your kingdom, your glory. You've got two different types of people groups. Yeshua comes in, he's a young boy. Can anybody find that scripture reference for me? It was like in Matthew 2 or something, wasn't it? Let me try and find it so I don't get the words wrong. What do you do? I'm um, looking for the one where he's sitting in the temple. Just go really. With Herod. Huh? With Herod. No. Not in that view. Yeah, it's one of those. You check it, I'll check Mark. Let me read from verse, um, yeah, Luke 2, verse 39. When Yosef and Miriam had finished doing everything required by the Torah of Adonai, they returned to the Galil, to the town of Bethsaida. The child grew and became strong and filled with wisdom. God's favor was upon him. Every year, Yeshua's parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Pesach when he was 12 years old. They went up to the festival as custom required, as Torah required. But after the festival was over, when his parents returned, Yeshua remained in Yerushalayim. They didn't realize this, supposing that he was somewhere in the caravan. They spent the whole day on the road before they began searching for him among their relatives and friends. Failing to find him, they returned to Yerushalayim to look for him. On the third day, interesting, they found him. He was sitting in the temple court among the rabbis, not only listening to them, but questioning what they said. And everyone who heard him was astonished at the insight in his responses. Fast forward a little later, they couldn't believe who had taught him. This man wasn't taught, right? When his parents saw him, they were shocked. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been terribly worried looking for you. He said to them, Why did you have to look for me? Didn't you know that I had to be concerning myself with my father's affairs? Whose kingdom was he building? His favorite topic, the kingdom of heaven. What did these guys do? 32. What is Pharaoh about? Pharaoh. What is Herod about? Herod. What is your nation about? Itself. When a nation's heart starts to beat for God, that's when your kingdom works. The problem is, how many nations do we have that year? Even when they say they say it's a Christian nation. Sadly, even those who were strong believers are more concerned about their political affairs and about their worship to God. Okay? So as we're going to go into the next chapters, he's going to be dealing with shepherds and all types of other interesting things, and then we're going to get to those fun things of restoration. Yes. All right. Any questions, any thoughts? Just the, the one thing you're saying there in regards to... Rome and Egypt and all those are not going to come back like that again. It's interesting to take a look that everybody's looking for a religious figure to, to lead them today yeah. across all the different religions. And also, politically, everybody's looking for someone. If you take a look at Europe and everything, they're all going far right now, so they're all looking for, because they're saying, you know, what they were voting for and what they did want. You take a look at Brexit and all that, it's not what the yeah. citizens wanted. And in America as well, it's just they're saying, you know, this is what we wanted, and they were going for more of these social characters than yes. than for people with hearts. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting setting up the timeline where we are. Yeah, I'm sure people are not about themselves, right? Okay. Good day. Great time is every time.
<laughs> Is your brother's name right? Gavin. Gavin. Father, we just thank you that we can come before you and we can search your feet and study your word. Father, we pray that you would open up our eyes and our hearts, Lord Father, to your truth. And Abba, we pray that you would just, that your work of redemption, Lord Father, we immerse each and every one of us, Lord Father, that your, that this mercy, Lord Father, would open up our eyes, our hearts, renew our minds, Lord Father, fill us, Lord that we may walk in your ways. Father, we lift up the fellowship, Lord Father, and we just thank you, Father, that you would keep your hand over each and every person that attends here. Father, that you would bring them into the gathering, Lord Father, of your flock, that we would be able to sit and rejoice and, and study your word, Lord Father, with the intent on becoming more and more like you. And we just thank you, Father, that you would light a light inside of each and every one of us, Lord Father, so that when we stand together, Lord, the light is so bright that many other people will be able to see it, feel it, and be able to come in. And not for us, Lord Father, but for you. May we build up your kingdom. May we be about your business, Lord Father. May we train them up, Lord Father, and release them so that they may be able to build your kingdom as they go forth. Just as you have given us discipleship, may we train up disciples. May we lead each and every one here, Lord Father, so that they become more like you. We thank you for that. Abba, as we stand here, as we sit here as well, Lord Father, we just pray for Gavin. Father, we just pray that you would just dissolve this cross right now in Yeshua's name. That everything, Lord Father, would just be kept completely dead still, Lord Father. That they would not move, but they would completely dissolve miraculously. So that when they look for them again, they'll go and find them. That blood pressure, Lord Father, would be restored. Blood flow, lung, lungs would work normally, the heart wouldn't have any issues, Lord Father, that... There would be no damage in any way, shape, or form that the doctors would scratch their heads and just look at this and go, we don't understand. And that's when we can step in, Lord Father, and we can say, maybe there was a fellowship behind them praying, Father, for your hand. Father, we know that you know the hearts, we know the situation, and we do not want to get in the way of your dealings, Father, so we pray that your will be done. And we thank you, Father, that you have said that if we pray to you, Lord Father, you would write across every stone. We thank you, Father, for your healing. We thank you for your restoration. We thank you for your life, Lord Father. We just thank you for your will being done. In your shirt, let me pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Okay, Dr. Thanks, guys.